Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm very pleased to present Philip Castle, who is a military historian, and his father was in Bomber Command, which as you know is the subject of the talk today. So without further ado, um, thank you very much to Philip, and I'll hand you over to him. Thanks, Sophie. Feels like a church service in here, doesn't it? You know, say prayers and then get on with that. Um, thank you for that, Sophie. Look, I don't want to say very much about me because the story isn't really about me. I do make some references to my own connection to Bomber Command and why I've had an interest in it since as early as I can remember, actually. But just a few background points is I was born in Canberra, partly raised in Canberra. My father was um, in the Air Force during the Second World War as a, he became a warrant officer pilot. Uh, he went to England. Fortunately, and I'll give you a bit more information on that shortly, he arrived too late for the serious action, which is probably a good thing because otherwise I mightn't be talking here because so many didn't come back and we know that. But before we do anything else, I would just like us to remember that today is Remembrance Day and the 11th, the 11th, when that awful war finished in 1918. And I've done a lot of research, a lot of talking about the tragedy of that first major war that Australia was involved in and the repercussions for that. I believe that actually World War I really brought on World War II, but that's another topic for another time in a different place. Today, I'm also, I understand uh, my ego has been really satisfied. I'm your third uh, guest who was supposed to be talking today. So I said to Dean Prangley when he invited me, I said, I'm third on the list, am I? And he said, yes. So I said, okay, that's fine. I don't have a very strong Queensland act, uh, element to what I'm talking about, and I apologise for that. Not that the Queenslanders weren't involved in Bomber Command, many were, but it's more about Australians, and my topic for today is the Australians in Bomber Command. One or two other things that I'd just like to acknowledge, first of all, Laurie Woods is here, and Laurie, so pleased to see you and up and about. I'm told your age is 98, is that correct? Yeah. Well done. I think we all should congratulate Laurie. And, uh, Laurie uh, has probably more knowledge of this subject than I do, and I will defer to him. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to annoy him a little bit by saying he can't interject until I'm finished, and then we can take some questions and comments, and he may well have some uh, sort of views that can help us understand what happened in Bomber Command. The other person I'd like to acknowledge here is Daryl Holden, who's sitting there holding my pink phone. Daryl, if you could just put your hand up. He's a good mate of mine. He was in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot at the same time as I was. Not that we, we may have encountered each other, but we haven't really worked that out. I was had a pretty soft job down in the embassy in Saigon doing things that probably I still can't talk about. And that also is another topic for another time. Let's get on with the, uh, well, just a little bit of background of me. I'm a journalist and I can recall going over to the Australian War Memorial and seeing, have we got a problem, Sophie, or are all good? Just checking it's Oh, okay, you're fine. just checking that I'm photographic enough. I can tell you I'm not. So, um, the G for George, which I'm going to talk about, the famous Lancaster, which is located now in Pryder Place in Aeroplane Hall, was languishing out at Fairburn, which is, what the old airport used to be, used to sit out there in the sun and I've climbed over it, a bit like the Mephisto. Remember the Mephisto? I sort of stood out there and then someone realised, hey, that's a valuable piece of equipment now, priceless. The same with G for George. It stood out in the rain and bits and pieces of it were knocked off. The kids used to climb all over it. Till 1956, someone realised it was a very important uh, item and it's really probably the most iconic uh, element of uh, the Australian War Memorial. And I can recall even as a very young youngster walking around there and Dad talking about the crews who went out particularly on the Lancaster. And he told stories about some of the aircraft coming in badly damaged and some of the crew were wounded or dead and particularly the horrific stories about the tail gunners who really suffered very badly. But look, all those crew, and I would say that as part of our remembrance of uh, thoughts today, they were very brave and very giving young men, some of the brightest and best who Australia could offer, and they went over and fought a war which uh, was a long way from home again, 
and we'll come to that. So I'm going to start working through the story and I believe I've got three hours so we'll be finished by about four o'clock. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Look, I hope only to go for about 40 minutes and what I've done with that presentation, <laughs> it's a very dramatic painting but someone like Laurie would immediately pick a major fault in it and that is that the aircraft are coming in very low over Cologne. Now, they wouldn't have come in at that height. It was too low. It happened. Well, it did happen sometimes. But you can see all the Lancasters are there at about a thousand feet. Well, that isn't quite what height they came in. Actually, a very good friend of mine from Queensland named Bob Gordon. Some of you might know him. He was my um, uh, chief of staff at the Canberra Times where I worked and became the editor of the Sunday Mail. His father was with 460 Squadron. And I oh, hadn't meant to tell this story, but Bob told me one day that his father hadn't survived World War II, so I looked it up for him, and I found out he was a navigator. And he, at the last moment, he'd completed his missions, which was 30, and he agreed to backfill to go in as a navigator for a crew that their navigator, for some reason, wasn't able to do that mission, and they went to Cologne. And I've read the report. The pilot, never acknowledged for this, his aircraft became badly damaged around Cologne and they were trying to actually break the bridge. And I don't know if anyone's been to Cologne, but the cathedral survived, amazingly survived, a bit like St Paul's in London. And with Bob's father, and the pilot realised he was in a lot of trouble, still had his bomb load and headed for the bridge, told the crew to bail out and about four of them did get out, including Bob's father. And unfortunately, when they landed, the Gestapo got hold of them and executed the four of them. They wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have, they were regarded as terror flurs or terror fighters. So Bob was fairly aggrieved that his father had lost his life quite late in the war. I think that was about February or March of 1945. It's just one of those stories. That's what happens. That's how the war went. But anyway, that's Cologne, or a, a version of Cologne. That's um, Australia's participation. Now, some of these figures are a little bit difficult to verify absolutely, but there are about 126,000 aircrew who served in Bomber Command. Now, this figure of 75,000 who were operational is a bit rubbery. I think it was more than that. But of those crews who served in Bomber Command, and I'm only talking about Bomber Command, I'm not talking about some of the other squadrons, some of the other activities like Coastal Command or you know, some of the fighter squadrons, 57,205 of them were killed. So if you go on the raw figures, you know, that's 46%. So the death rate, the loss of life in Bomber Command was enormously great. And it was certainly great for Australians too, who served, and I'll come to that. Uh, eight and a half thousand were wounded. You didn't stand a lot of chance once things went wrong in an aircraft, you know, your survival rates were, uh, quite poor. Of course, a number of them became prisoners of war. Uh, more than 21,500 aircrew went to the UK. Not all of them went into Bomber Command, but many did, and that was probably the primary place where Australian aircrew served, because with bombers you have a much greater need of crew. If you've got a fighter or a, a smaller aircraft where only two or three are needed. The other one that Australians served with distinction had our own squadron was Coastal Command. And that's another story for another time. Uh, approximately three and a half thousand Australians died in Bomber Command. Now that figure is a little bit low, but that's the best figure I can come up with. And about 800 of them, I'll come back to you, about 800 of them uh, died in other ways, like training accidents or, you know, there are other things that happen on the basis. Almost 1,500 aircrew became prisoners of war, so a lot of Australians from Bomber Command ended up in, in prisoner of war camps. Just to jump ahead, there was a pretty sad event that happened towards the end of the Second World War where a lot of the POWs were on the Russian side of, well, they were in Poland, and then they had what they call the Great March through very cold conditions, and a lot of the prisoners were marched away from the Russians towards the, the Western Allies, the Americans, British and uh, French, and quite a few of them suffered very badly and occasionally they were strafed by the Allies without realising that they were... But that also is another story and it's worth reading. It's quite a sad story, really. Hitler was, had indicated 
that he would use the prisoners of war as a bargaining chip to try and get a conditional surrender. But Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt, who was still alive at the time, wouldn't agree to anything other than an unconditional surrender from the part of the Germans. Uh, nearly all of the Australians were, highly, were young, highly trained and key aircrew. I haven't done a full analysis, but I think the average age is somewhere between 21 and 23 of the Australian service people who served in Bomber Command. Many served not just in Australian squadrons, they were supposed to go and backfill or form Australian squadron. Many of them disappeared into RAF units, so quite a few Australians were in all sorts of squadrons. And I will come to a fellow that I got to know very well who's since passed on, Vic Henderson, who served with the 143rd Squadron RAF. But a lot of Australians were just placed wherever they were needed. Um, one of the key elements and one of the reasons I became very interested in this was the Empire Air Training Scheme, which was a scheme, and I did unfortunately let a mistake go through in the promotion, it only involved three countries. Australia, Canada and New Zealand. And it was an agreement not with, I think in the promo it said South Africa and Rhodesia. There were other pilots from other nations, but they directly joined the RAF, although I think the South Africans might have had their own squadron. But with the Empire, or EATS as it's sometime known as, the agreement was Australia, Canada and New Zealand would supply trained aircrew. And that was quite a significant agreement to provide aircrew. And they were mostly trained in Australia, so they did their basic flying and experience and also selection. So I understand, and this came from my father as well as many others, everyone wanted to be a pilot, but not everyone could be a pilot. So there were various ways of dealing with who would become a pilot and who wouldn't become a pilot. And not necessarily the best and brightest, but those who either impressed people or came from the right family or had that, there's no, clear indication as to how they really selected their pilot. But about 35% uh, of those who were selected as pilots didn't go on to continue their training and some of them were offered positions in other places as air crew. Um, there was a continuous supply of Australians and they, there were 11 airfields around Australia where they did their training. Uh, after their initial basic training in, in New South Wales, and that's where I know my father came from, he started at Bradfield Park. They did three months, and that's where they sorted out who would go where. And then they, he went on to flying school at a place called Tamora in central New South Wales, and then he went to Point Cook, where he, I'll come back to that. Um, then by 1944, there was an oversupply of aircrew. Not earlier, there was a shortage of aircrew in 42, 43, because the casualties were so high. But by 1944, they had found that they were actually running out of aircraft. So they had more crew than they could uh, usefully use. And I know my father was uh, doing things which he really hated doing. For example, he had to do a commando course. And he said he didn't join the Air Force to slog around in the mud for two weeks in the British winter. And they got quite sick of that. And I think they gave their instructors more you know, hurry up than they received themselves. But he ended up becoming a qualified navigator as well, so he was a pilot navigator. But there was a surplus. It was anticipated that D-Day, the invasion of Europe, would cause a lot more casualties than it did. But a lot of things happened around that period which saved the lives of many of the aircrew, not least being the fact that the fighter escorts were there, and I'll come to that, but also they were starting to move into Europe, so their flights were... He was offered a position to fly typhoons, which was highly dangerous, and I'm glad he didn't, because once again, I mightn't be here, but he decided he was a multi-engine pilot, better than a single-engine pilot. And I don't know if any of you, I know this gets very technical, anyone actually stood next to a typhoon? They're a huge aircraft, aren't they? You know, you sort of think, you think they're like a Spitfire, but they're about eight or nine times the size of a Spitfire, and they're enormous. They were used mostly for rocket attacks on German particularly their tanks. I'll try and stick to the story. This is just very briefly. I haven't spoken about him for many years. My dad passed away in 2002, but that's him. He was born in Wagga. He started off in Tiger Moths. He then went to um, Point Cook, and he's, I found that photograph, which I thought I'd lost of him getting his wings, and I think, Darrell, what's a four striper? Is that a wing commander or a group captain? Group captain. Group captain. 
He's getting his wings presented there at Point Cook. Down on the right hand side, you'll see he's actually got, he's a flight sergeant. He became a Warren officer later in England. You'll see the touch up uh, colours. On the top, he's got, you know, the forage cap or the, the cap. That's in a very dark blue, which was the colour of the Australian Air Force. They ran out of uniforms, so they gave them the elephant grey, which is a British uniform, and that's why he's that. And the only thing that distinguished that uniform was the Australia on the sleeve, on the shoulder. And, uh, but they, were, they were, did have enough of this pure blue to give him a cap. But he said they actually hated having to be identified as RAF rather than RAAF with the uniform, but that's all they could give them, so that's the way it was. Uh, look, he didn't actually go on operations, so I don't, he did go to the operational training unit and he was ready to go. He then trained as a navigator, became an instructor, uh, pilot instructor, and he started once the war had ended in uh, Europe, they had a, an organisation called Tiger Force, which was meant to transfer a lot of the trained aircrew and Lancasters across to the Pacific War. Of course, that ended fairly quickly after the bombing of Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. And he came back, he had to wait around England for about three months. He said it was the best period of his whole Air Force career because they were told to go on holidays, had to ring in about every two or three days to see whether there was a ship to take them home. And he was up, I don't know if any of you know England very well, but he was up around the Lakes District. And he said they had a ball. They used to go hiking and riding and he said a good paid holiday. Finally, he came home in the Aquitania and settled into the public service and I came along 10 months later. Enough of my dad. I have written a number of articles on this and I'll just show you, that was one that I wrote. And down in the right hand corner, you'll see there's a fellow there by the name of Cherry Carter. Cherry flew more missions on G for George than anyone else. Uh, he did 25. And if you look at the um, insignia on G for George today, you'll see the cherries. Anyone know why he was called Cherry? <laughs> He was as bald as a badger when I met him and he lived down the Gold Coast. He's since passed on. He was a redhead, so they called him Cherry. And he did his finishing off training in Canada and then became a pilot with 460 Squadron. I think probably before you, Laurie, I think he... Was Cherry around when you were there? Do you know? Carter? No. I think his, his time was in 43 more. I met him after the war. Did you? Okay. Look, a very modest man, became a Qantas uh, 707 captain, actually, and flew for Qantas after the war. Uh, that's him with his daughter on the, uh, on the bottom right-hand corner. But I have a number of articles that I've published on Bomber Command. Just very briefly, the aircraft, uh, I won't go through them all. The Tiger Moth was the primary training aircraft for pilots in Australia. They had the Wacket. The Anson was the multi-engine aircraft that was flown in Australia. Down here you've got the Blenheim, which was one of the first bombers, the Ferry Battle, which was an awful aircraft. The Wellington became fairly famous early in the war. A lot of Australians flew in that. It was fairly susceptible to attack, but it had one redeeming design feature. It was actually designed in a circular fashion so it could take enormous damage, so that if it was shot up or was attacked by any aircraft fire, it could actually still fly. So that it meant that some of them came back in a you know, very poor state, but they were still able to land. The Halifax was the twin brother, if I can say to speak, of the Lancaster, which is in the middle bottom. And then of course the Mosquito, which was a remarkable aircraft, which did and was used in Bomber Command. And I'll come back to that shortly. Uh, that's another photo or another display of the various aircraft that were used, much the same as I've just shown you. Um, now let's talk about the Germans for a moment. They had some pretty good aircraft and very, very efficient in taking out the bombers, particularly in 43 and 44, where they're night fighters and the Ju-88 was probably one of the primary destroyers of a of bomber command aircraft. Used to come in underneath the aircraft had his guns fixed and would actually hit them before they delivered their payload. So often the whole aircraft would explode and there would be virtually nothing left of anything or anyone once that happened. Now one of the pilots there, whose name is, uh, what's his name, Wolfgox Neifer I think it is, he accounted for 121 Allied aircraft. And if you multiply the crews that were taken out by him, 
you know, you're looking at six, seven, you're looking at a 700 Allies you know, crew probably died or were shot out of the sky. Uh, he was quite proud of his performance. I mean, he just saw it as a professional thing. He was out there to stop the bombers bombing, you know, his country and his, his area. And uh, he was respected for what he was. I did see when I looked at the record, there was another German pilot who accounted for 170 plus aircraft, but some of those were on the Russian front. So that was probably more likely. And that's just a painting showing what would happen that the aircraft would come up, the day would come up underneath the, the Lancaster, which was very hard to detect. And of course the exhausts from the Lancaster were seen. And they also had a bit of a problem with the navigational sort of equipment that sometimes the German radars could lock onto it if it was still on and they would pick up. So some of the casualties were caused sadly by maybe not enough defensive use of their aircraft, but I'll come back to that. These are just the Bomber Command Squadrons and uh, there were, how many of them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 460 Squadron is probably the most famous and it's were the one that G for George come from. They each had a different code on the, the front of their letters and 460 Squadron was for the most part at Bimbrook, which is probably where you were, Laurie, at Bimbrook, yeah, which is on the uh, sort of central uh, east coast of England and I'll come to that shortly. And you'll see a lot of this material I got out of a very good book put out by Veterans Affairs called Bomber Command, the Australians in Bomber Command. I forgot to bring mine here, but it was a free book offered by Veterans Affairs and it was very well done. So I pulled quite a bit of material from that, but I do have about 25 books on this subject. That, I don't know if you can see it, but that's a map of England on the left-hand side. And I've just honed in on Bimrook because that's where it was. If you were doing an operation over to Berlin, you were looking at a pretty long flight, over a thousand kilometres there and back. And think about the risk that involved to your aircraft. Now, I've done a straight line. Often they were not straight lines, they'd try and come into the north and come out a different way. So it wasn't always a straight line. If you're in trouble, then probably you would head home as quickly as you could if you had an engine failure or had some damage or wounded on board. And the other uh, orange or yellow line is into the Ruhr Valley, both of which were very popular targets. Bombing of Berlin was more a propaganda exercise, but it was very significant. But I think all of the crew, when they opened the curtains to say where the destination was going to be, Berlin was the one that they realised was going to be the hardest and then because it was also heavily defended. Another one which I haven't shown there, which did occur from time to time, is attacks in northern Italy. So that was down further. That was also a fairly long flight, but also it meant going over the Alps. Right, I won't go into too much detail, but when you're crewing up for an operation, there was an interesting way that they sorted out who would be in what crew. And I heard many different stories about this, but it was always the same pattern. They'd put a bunch of fellows into a large room, hangar, conference room, and basically allowed people to sort out their own crew. And some people would grab a navigator or a gunner or a pilot, and then they'd walk around and say, oh, we need a, you know, a rear gunner, or we need a navigator. And they would basically join their team up by <laughs> coercion. That probably happened to you too, did it, Laurie? That sort of mould of a way, yeah. All right. is that correct? Anyway, look, I'll come back to you and I'll let you have a few comments shortly. But often the crew would then form itself into a very good working team because they then learnt to work with each other. On occasions, the pilot who was commander of the, or in command of the aircraft would sometimes be outranked by the navigator and sometimes even by a gunner. So sometimes you could have a sergeant pilot or a warrant officer pilot or a pilot officer who might have a flight lieutenant or a more senior person in the crew. Normally, not entirely, but normally the pilot was generally the, the more senior officer, but they could also come from other areas of the Air Force, so they weren't necessarily all Australians. In fact, in 460 Squadron, my figures show that about 600, maybe about 580, were from the RAAF, from the Australian Air Force, but of the others, 
there was British, there was Canadians, there were other people who served in those squadrons. So they generally put them where they were needed. And sometimes if a crew person was wounded or for whatever reason wasn't able to complete their tour, then they would be replaced with someone else who came in who was available. And initially they used very poor aircraft and they did the training of ATUs and then they went to squadrons, they were posted to squadrons. Um, many of the early RAF bombers were at, inadequate for the task and they were shot out of the sky, and the, particularly the Blenheims, and uh, they suffered quite badly. That was where Huey Edwards actually first got his Victoria Cross, and I'll come back to him. But it, and initially they weren't even doing bombing runs, they were dropping leaflets to try and tell the Germans that they shouldn't be, you know, having a war, which wasn't very helpful to anyone. I think uh, many of them felt disgusted on those raids, they'd risk themselves and then be shot at because they were dropping leaflets. But later on, particularly, I keep coming back to the Lancaster because the Lancaster is the iconic aircraft that was used by Bomber Command more after 1942. Um, there were a couple of problems with the Lancaster, and I'll come back to that shortly. The Mosquitoes were a very efficient aircraft, an all-wooden aircraft, very, it could get to a great height and could actually go unarmed over, out of range of the uh, fighters and the uh, anti-aircraft guns. They would often do weather reports. Uh, they'd go and take photographic reconnaissance before and after raids, and they could actually drop bombs. In fact, they were the first, I understand, I think the second raid on Berlin was was dropped by uh, mosquitoes. Interestingly, and here's a bit of a shot at the Americans, the American key bomber was the B-17, and it was loaded up with ammunition and gunners. It actually had a lesser payload than you could put on a mosquito. So a two-engine mosquito could actually take more bombs over to Europe than the initial aircraft, the B-17, from the Americans. Uh, we'll come back to rear gunners shortly. Um, Often when, well the sequence was, if a raid was on, generally the word would be passed around and you knew that the weather and the moon and you know the stars were aligned for a particular occasion and the people at the base would be closed. And they'd even uh, put uh, no movement or no real movement allowed on and off the base. This was to avoid any uh, small talk which might have given away the, the fact that they were going in an operation. And of course, there was often enough information if you were watching the airfield and the Germans did have some pretty good intelligence at times. They could pick up when things were happening on a base so they knew a raid was on. And then various people would be briefed on the target. And sometimes there was horror about the target because you know they were going to go a fair way but then they'd settle down and say, okay, well that's what we're going to do. And then there would be a final briefing and then they would be allowed to go off, sleep, or if they could, and then generally they took off at dusk. Now the British um, Bomber Command nearly always only operated at night time in this period. The Americans came in and they were doing daylight raids for quite a while until they couldn't continue the losses for that. But most of the raids were, d were on dusk, depending on where they were going. And if it was a long raid, well, it could be 10 or 12 hours before they came back. They would be driven out, well they get a briefing and you can see the, the fellows up the top there on the right hand side. They'd be taken out in a, generally a truck driven by a, a women Air Force driver who became quite attached. She would actually become quite familiar with her crew, as did the ground crew. And of course they were devastated when a crew didn't come back. But you can see the tense look on some of the faces of those fellows who were sitting, which was fair enough. I liken what was happening to World War I, where it was a bit like waiting in the trenches to go over the top. And I think there are a lot of similarities with that. The nervous anticipation and the re reality that you may not come back, you may not be alive within 10, 10 hours or so. Uh, they would take off, they were provided with special meals generally, and then they were driven out to the dispersed aircraft because they obviously didn't want to be attacked by German fighters or German bombers, so the aircraft would be located in uh, various holding patterns around the airfield. And they're often uh, farewell by a whole group of ground crew, various people who were associated with the squadron, even crew who weren't flying out that night. And as I said, some operations were up to 10 hours and I think could even be longer than 10. Once en route, mostly radio silence, the you know, leaving Britain was 
seen as being a bit of a sad departure and they were always heading towards the dark so they had the sun setting behind them in the west and that of course meant that if they had a long road they were actually flying back into with the sun behind them as the sun rose the next morning but they would head for the target on whatever route generally in a stream generally with other aircraft and they would have various ways of trying to avoid the flak nearly all of them people I've spoken to knew when they went across the coast because the flak would operate and because the Germans would be already alerted to the fact that bombers were coming. There were some techniques devised to try and fool the Germans, including a thing called a tinsel. Well, they used to chuck these metal strips out which were supposed to confuse the German radar, which did for a while. Or they would have sometimes decoy uh, attacks at various other places rather than the primary target. The, the biggest danger to as I said earlier, later was the night fighters, but also was the uh, ACAC, the uh, anti-aircraft fire, and there's an 88 down in the middle there. There were, for a while there was a thing that aircrew believed, which was never correct, they said there was a scarecrow, that the Germans used to blow up an explosion to make it look like there was an aircraft that had been attacked. Now that was debunked, and the scarecrows that the people saw were those huge explosions, which is an aircraft blowing up after it had been attacked by a night fighter. And of course, the bomb payload would explode as well, and that was quite scary. And now that's a daylight shot. Of night time, it was even, even worse. So it was a pretty horrific uh, experience. Probably the most um, memorable thing that I've heard from crew is actually lining up for the target, because you could weave, you could do things, you could take evasive action. But once you were set on the target, you really had to hold steady until the bombs were dropped on the target. And I interviewed Cheshire, who's the Victoria Cross winner, who was in charge of much of the Pathfinders. And um, he, while he was a very brave man, and I was impressed with him when I met him, he wasn't liked by some of the crew because he wanted the crew to bomb the target. And if they didn't bomb it properly, he'd send them around. And I spoke to a fellow from 460 Squadron a few years ago who said, they were sent around three times by Cheshire, who was sitting up there saying, no, go around again. You're not doing it correctly, go around again. And of course, the third time across the target would even be worse because the gunners and everyone was up to what they were doing. So that period of you know, steady and level flight until the bombs were away, and of course, enormous relief once the bombs had gone. They could get on their way and try and get back home safely. And on the right-hand side there was a very famous Australian aircraft called S for Sugar, which completed 100 missions. Pretty unusual. I think the record is something like there's an RAF from Lancaster that did 121 missions over enemy territory, and I think it's in the uh, Imperial Museum. And the Chief of George, the famous one, did 91, or there's a dispute as to whether it was 91 or 92. Hope you're not getting bored. Getting bored, going to sleep, anyone? Right, well, not too long. The German defences, as I said, their fighters were, were enormously efficient. And, but one of the things that is not understood about Bomber Command is they did tie up a lot of German resources. A lot of personnel were needed to operate their fighter squadrons, to operate their anti-aircraft, their radar, their servicing of all of the equipment that was needed to counter Bomber Command, and you might recall that in 1942, 41-42, Russia was complaining that there was no real front on you know, the western side, that they were doing all the heavy lifting. And so Bomber Command was the answer that, uh, that uh, Churchill gave and said, look, we are doing our part. So there was more pressure to actually keep Bomber Command operating because it was seen as the second front to help the Russians. And it did take a lot of resources away from Germany who had to then get over to the western side of Western Europe to counter Bomber Command. And of course, there was the enormous stomach damage done to industry, to cities, the clean up, the, uh, the use of you know, all sorts of auxiliary services to try and repair the railways or the dams or whatever had happened. So there's a fairly strong argument that Bomber Command actually put a lot of pressure on Germany to to try and counter the, uh, the activities of Bomber Command. And of course, then as it got close to D-Day, the Germans realised there was a, an invasion forthcoming and they started to try and prepare all sorts of things. And of course, Bomber Command was used, even against Harris's best judgement at times, to try and 
you know, take out some of the infrastructure before the Normandy landings. The, the worst period, I think, for Bomber Command was 1943 to 1944. They, if you look at the history, there were things that the British you know, RAF did which became improvements, like the tinsel, then they got better navigational equipment, then they got the pathfinders, but the British, the Germans counteracted it with various other things. They had more efficient, they counted the radar, they got better fighters, they got better at detecting where the aircraft were coming, and sadly, they had a pretty fair idea of who was coming. They had enough radio now to know as soon as the aircraft called in on base, before they'd even taken off, they would check in, say, you know, Jason George is ready, the Germans would then be able to work out how many aircraft were being prepared for that night's raid. So there's a lot of skullduggery going on both sides, some of which worked for a while and some of it didn't. Right, what happened after the raid? Well, as soon as they arrived back, they were given a bit of a special treat, uh, including some food, eggs, and some of the stuff that was quite severely rationed. But also, of course, some didn't come back and some of them have no known grave. They were just blown up or lost in the North Sea or just didn't have any record of what happened to them. That particular photograph is of a grave yard involving some Australian airmen who died in Holland and they were attended to by the local Dutch people. If you managed to bail out, then you ran the risk of being captured. And if you weren't captured, then you had the problem of whether you could escape safely by the, particularly the French underground, and some did. They went out, many of them, well not many of them, some through Spain. Of course, all of you are familiar with the movie The Great Escape, which I find really annoying because it involves uh, McQueen, an American, and there were no US people involved in The Great Escape whatsoever. They were all British, Canadians, Australians. Sadly, there was a, um, a payback for that. There's, I think it was 71 got out of which they rounded up nearly all of them. I think only three managed to get back to England. And Hitler ordered, he was really annoyed about it, and he ordered for about uh, 30 of them to be executed. They were executed by the Gestapo, which has still caused a fair bit of angst. But the, the story of the Great Escape is quite amazing. There are always escapes on, and there were some very clever activities used to try and get home. And some did, not a lot. Interestingly, if you look at the other side, the Germans only successfully, there was only one German Luftwaffe person who managed to escape from the Allies, and he escaped through Canada via the United States. So the Germans weren't very good at getting back across to their country, but at least the, uh, the Allies, including the Americans, did succeed to some extent. Um, as I said with Bob Gordon's father, he was executed Towards the end of the war, and there's no excuse for it, I know, but when you're being bombed and when you see your families killed and the, your city's ruined, of course the Germans started it and they started the, and I remember a German person saying this to me, a historian, well we paid the price for starting the war and places like Coventry were, were attacked, is sometimes they'd be caught and they would be, you know, be mobbed and sometimes handed over to the Gestapo who would execute them. Now, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, tried to get hold of any prisoners that had come, you know, landed, because they knew that there were Luftwaffe prisoners of war and they wanted them to be treated, because it was against the Geneva Convention to kill genuine service people who had been only doing their job in much the way that the Luftwaffe had. There's one story that I've seen documented just about a tail gunner, and I think he holds the record for the biggest free fall ever without a parachute. And he went out of the back of a Lancaster. I wasn't Australian as far as I remember. I think he was a British RAF. Uh, because the rear gunner didn't have his parachute next to him. It was behind him. He had to reach out and get it if he needed to get out of the aircraft quickly. And this fellow took his chances. And he landed, I think he was at, his aircraft was estimated at 12,000 feet. He hit some pine trees and then fell into some snow drifts and ended up with two broken legs and survived. But the Germans wouldn't believe this initially when they found him. They said he was a spy and he was exaggerating his fall. And then they checked it out that he had actually left a particular aircraft and other crew sort of confirmed that he was in that flight. So not a bad effort, 12,000 feet without a parachute and you survive. I wouldn't suggest anyone tries it a second time. Um, right. I think I'm getting 
This is a very famous painting by Stella Brown, a very well-known Australian artist who went to Bimbrook and decided to paint a crew. And she began her painting and sadly the crew didn't return, only one of them survived and he's the fellow up the top, Lynch, the pilot of the aircraft is Jarman, a very famous photograph and there's been a lot written and a lot said about that photograph and you can see the cover of the book Bomber Command Australians in World War II is the cover of the book that uh, I recommend you have a read if you want to know more. Look, I won't go into this very much. Um, the big saviour for Bomber Command was the introduction of the Mustang P-51 Spitfire, uh, Mustang. And it had the range, the capacity to actually provide a, a fighter escort for the bombers. Up till that, the aircraft could only go so far and then they had to return. They even tried experimenting with you know, fuel tanks on the Spitfires so they could go a bit further, but all of the Germans did just waited until the Spitfires and all the other escorts turned back and then they attacked the bombers. So the Mustang became very important for defending not just the British, but the US. And I haven't referred to the US role. They played a very significant role, mostly in daylight raids, but that's another story. Um, there was a bit of an argument, and actually Daryl knows more about this than I do, Harris was very fixated about the policies he wanted to have implemented by Bomber Command and he was even a bit reluctant to allow Bomber Command to be used to soften up the areas of France where Normandy landing later occurred. But so there was a bit of a tussle, more than a tussle, between what Bomber Harris wanted and what Churchill and the other military leaders had. But I'm going to stay out of that argument because it's a very complex argument. And it's one that probably a lot of the air crew didn't know a lot about because it was up there at that very senior political level. I have to say this and I apologise to anyone who has a different view to me. I'm no great fan of Churchill. I, as a true blue Australian for many reasons, I, and I noticed that he never bothered to visit our country and we probably didn't want him to either, but that's different. But I believe that Churchill was as much in complicity with Harris about the total bombing until Dresden, and I'll talk about Dresden in a moment because that's a very controversial topic. Um, the Germans did have some developments. Uh, I won't talk about the V1, V2, the rockets, but they did develop the first really fighter jet, the, uh, the Messerschmitt 262, which was an amazing surprise when it first was encountered, but they didn't have enough of them and they weren't very effective. But in the top right-hand corner, you can see the uh, the Mustang, that's in British colours, RAF colours, but of course the Americans flew them and the Australians had them too in various roles and particularly up um, here in the Pacific campaign as well and they were used a bit in Korea. Um, some of the targets after D-Day became very significant where they were trying to bomb out the sites of the V-1, which was the Doodlebug, the sort of little rocket that used to fly across England. My father had an encounter with those a few times. But then of course the V2, which nothing could be done to stop it once it was launched. But there was a lot of activity to try and bomb their factory making and their launching sites for the V2 by Bomber Command. Very important role they had there. Right, let's talk about a couple of Queenslanders. How are we going for time? Yeah, okay, I'll probably wrap it up pretty soon. Don Bennett, born in Toowoomba, went to Boys Grammar joined the RAAF, went into the RAF. He became an amazingly interesting story. He was shot down over uh, Norway, managed to escape to Sweden, came back, was a brilliant pilot, and he set about setting up the Pathfinder, which was the way in which they then identified targets before the mainstream bombers came in. They would drop flares and other markers so that the bombers coming in next could actually bomb the target. In the early stages of World War II, a lot of the bombs just fell short of the target or even were deceptively decoyed to other places. In fact, there's a figure that suggested in about 1941 that less than 10% of the bombs fell on the target, so they weren't very efficient then. And that did improve. Harris thought he was a remarkable man, and he was a remarkable man. He became a politician. Apparently he had a very prickly personality, but that's another story. But he was certainly a proud Australian, and he remembered even the Brisbane boys' grammar, they regard him as one of their significant old boys. Huey Edwards, and Laurie tells me he's shaking the hand of Huey Edwards, he actually earned his Victoria Cross in Australia, similar flying experience to, um, to Bennett. He joined the RAF and was 
awarded the Victoria Cross very early in the raid over Bremen, which was a very brave raid, and there's a painting of it there. He uh, became the CO of the 460 Squadron, to which Laurie belongs, came from, and he had quite a remarkable career even afterwards. Um, the first Australian Victoria Cross winner in World War II for the Air Force was Rawdon Middleton, who sacrificed his own life to allow his crew to bail out. He'd done a significant raid over to Italy, and he brought back his crippled aircraft, along with, he was quite badly wounded, and his body was washed up ashore, and uh, he was buried with full military honours. Coming to the end of World War II, two things happened which a lot of people have spoken to me about, including my father, is there was a thing called Operation Manor, Holland had been bypassed by the Allies because they were heading straight for Germany via the Rhine and they ended up having a very harsh winter and starving. And some of the, I lived in Holland with my parents because Dad went there as an immigration officer when I was nine and I, the people used to talk about that awful winter. They, many, many people died and they were getting leaves off the trees to try and make soup and they were starving. An agreement was reached towards the end of the Second World War that they could drop food to them, certain locations, and many crew were involved in Operation Manor and spoke very highly of how privileged they felt to be flying across at 500 feet, watched by the Germans. The Germans were not allowed to take any of the food. And, uh, everyone? 200 feet. 200 feet, okay, all right. Yeah, well, that was the problem because they didn't have parachutes. So they were dropping them, and if they dropped them from 500 feet, there'd probably be bugger all left. And in fact, there was one port, uh, Dutch kid who got killed by a flying bit of food. So uh, the Americans didn't obviously, with their beef, uh, beach 17, they were dropping them a lot higher, but that Lancaster in the other photograph is, uh, yeah, it could be 200 feet, pretty low anyway. And of course the risk was, the Germans did obey the rules, they didn't shoot any of them down. And the next, you can see the food that was there, mostly fairly important food. Um, the other thing that happened was, after the war, a lot of POWs needed to be taken back home, and that was a very uh, significant operation because they really enjoyed picking up, some of these fellows had been in captivity for six years, so it was, and they apparently were overawed and emotional when they hit the coast of England on their, on their route back. Now, the famous Lancaster, uh, it probably is, apart from the Spitfire, the most iconic aircraft in British circles for us and for Australians. And it certainly is a wonderful aircraft, and I've just got a few facts about that. One of the design features of the Lancaster, which made it very hard to bomb the factories, it could be made in parts, and every part could be fitted onto a railway line, onto a railway carriage. So they would often put the fuselage and the wings and the other bits and pieces. So many places were building Lancasters quite away from any central factory, which made it very difficult for the Germans to take out their front. It had a range of about 3,000 miles, so that could get you to Berlin and back, provided you weren't shot up and provided you, you know, had a reasonable... It could take a bomb load of 14,000 pounds. That was the design. They decided they needed a much bigger bomb to try and hit the U-boat pens, and they put a 22,000 pound bomb in it, and apparently the first time it was tested, they all stood there with their fingers crossed, waiting to see if this Lancaster could actually get into the air, and it could. It was a remarkable aircraft. It came out of the Manchester, which was a two-engine aircraft, uh, not very good. Uh, Australia, the Royal Australian Air Force only ever owned three Lancasters, one of which was due for George, and the other one was Queenie, which I think was crashed up at Townsville. But I know this is a bit, Silly to say, but it is actually an interesting aircraft. It looks good, doesn't it? It's a good sort of design, but it's a killing machine, as is the Spitfire, of course. Um, the famous G for George. I've caused a bit of controversy with the War Memorial because there's a hammer and sickle in the middle there, and no one's ever been able to explain it. I've tried, and I've, they just can't give me the answer. The other thing, if you want to be a real smart ass like me, if you go to the War Memorial, you could ask even the guides and say, what's on the tip of the propellers there? And they hardly ever notice. Does anyone know what's on the tip of the propellers? A swastika. You can't see it in the photo, but right at the tip, there's a little swastika, so someone has... They also had a lot of trouble restoring the 
uh, G for George to its correct colours. And they went to enormous trouble to try and get back to the original paintwork. When it came to Australia, it was taken around the country as a war bond promotion. People got inside the Lancaster and signed their, their name if they paid 50 pounds for war bonds. So they've actually restored that. I think they've spent $13 million restoring it over the past 10 years or so when they left it out in the, in the weather for 10 years and didn't look after it. Uh, a wonderful aircraft, it did. There's a couple of books written on it. Uh, that's the G for George ground crew, and I think I'm coming to the end pretty soon. That's Cherry Carter up on the, um, the far right looking down. That's pretty close to when they finished its operation. It flew out to Australia with the crew, and I think Laurie knew who some of the crew were. Just a couple of contentious issues, and I'm going to stop here because I think our time has gone and I want to allow some time for questions, is the policies that um, Harris promoted have been controversial. And you can read a lot about whether he was right for pushing so hard for Bomber Command to particularly you know, adopt the strategies he did. Uh, I believe he was doing what he was asked to do, uh, but that's not as simple as that. Um, a lot of missions, you, had to, you could do 30 and then you could say, look, I've done my bit. A lot of crew didn't make 30 missions, but if you did 30, but what constituted a mission sometimes became contentious. If you took off and got halfway there and had engine failure, or as one case, a Lancaster got attacked by a night fighter over the North Sea, it came back. It wasn't counted as a mission. And the blacks said, hang on, you know, we've done a mission. Quite often the crew would be, you know, uh, not have the same number of missions. Some fellows wanted to complete the missions with their mates. So they would say, oh look, I've done my 30, but I'll go and I'll come out with you tonight and I'll you know, make sure that you get your missions. You could choose to do a second stint after a little while. The question was, what did you do once you'd completed your missions? Some of them came home, some of them went to training, some of them went back to Pathfinders, and a couple of people ended up doing you know, 100 missions a day, very few, because that was pretty risky. In the early stages, your likelihood of actually completing 30 missions were pretty low. So, you know, even if you got to the 30, you'd have to go, phew, you know, I've done that, done my bit. Uh, of course, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of those fellows saw horrendous things. They saw their mates killed. They saw things which are indescribable. And they weren't really cared for in a way that was needed. There was an awful thing which my father talked about a lot and other people called um, LMF, um, which was lack of moral fibre. If some poor crewman had got the shakes or had felt he couldn't do this anymore, they were literally drummed out of their squadron and disgraced in a way that was quite dreadful. They were treated very hum inhumanely, so badly that the Canadians said, we're not going to have anyone charged with the LMF. Uh, the Australians allowed it to happen. And I noticed that quite recently the, um, the British authorities have actually agreed to wipe the record off LMS people. Now, Dad said he felt really sorry for some of these fellows who really had just reached the end of their tether. You know, they'd seen so much and they said, I just can't go anymore. Well, they were charged, you know, they were treated in a very dreadful way, which is quite an indictment on how they were treated. To lose so many fellows, one day you'd be sitting in the mess with them and next day they were gone, gone from Burton. They weren't there anymore and sometimes you had no idea what happened to them and nothing more was heard. You had a very interesting committee called the Committee for Adjustment, which would come in early in the morning if someone was missing or presumed dead and they'd collect all the personal items. So within about three or four hours, the mates that you had in other rooms would be completely you know, denuded. Their, their photos, their letters, their uniforms, their equipment was all taken up and ultimately obviously given to next to kin. There were two separate communities. You had the ground crew and you know all the silly stuff, and you had the operational crew who came through. While there was a bit of mixing, it was actually obviously quite different if you were on operations to being a, and some of the ground crew people did get uh, bombed and they were very highly regarded by the crew because they kept them safe. But there were uh, different sort of <laughs> groups on every airfield. There were almost two villages or two communities, so to speak. There was a lot of um, oh, angst about what rank you should have. One of the reasons all the Australians were promoted to sergeants or warrant officers or commission officers is because if they were captured, they would then be treated by the Germans as officers and wouldn't be required to do the hard labour and the other things which other ranks would have to do. Uh, 
sometimes the discipline was, you know, a bit extraordinary. It didn't work very well, but I won't go into that. And I think I'm going to close off pretty soon. After the war, these are Daryl's slides. There's a monument which he went to, which is the first time really Bomber Command has been on it. And um, Vic Anderson is a fellow who died two years ago. I got to know Vic very well. He was a gunner observer and he did his 30 missions and he did, he went, was one of the Australians who went to the UK. He's over there in the left hand corner. And that's him and his wife. His wife was a dental assistant in the RAF. That's how they met. They lived out at Kenmore. And Vic was a bit of an old, yeah, lovely fellow, but he said he really enjoyed having that a very tall sergeant escort. He said she was wonderful and beautiful and looked after them like they were kings. They had escorts throughout. I was there, why didn't you have me? Well, I haven't got a photograph of you. Oh, are you where are you? Okay, that's, you're probably in that photo somewhere, right? Eh? Yes. Where are you? I don't know. Okay, we'll have a look at it later. I'm gonna finish. I think I'll go through here. Uh, was it worth it? Well, yes and no. It certainly stopped fascism. We paid a huge price for it, and that's where I stop. And I'm sorry, what is the time? 26, we've got, we've got five minutes. Where's Sophie? Is she here? Gone. I'll have to take the questions. Thank you, I'm a bit rushed, but I hope that, that it's a very complex subject, and I've only taken a slice of it. Anyone? Laurie, did you want to make a few comments? Oh, yeah. Okay, here you go then. <laughs> You've only got a few minutes. You sit in warm. You've been listening to this man. He's, uh, he didn't have life on the squadron, which makes a hell of a difference. Uh, I was part of the, uh, the training here in Australia and uh, from Mount Gambier, we were sent off to the Adelaide uh, Harbour section looking for Jap submarines. And we were sent off in an Anson. An Anson, if the wind was blowing hard enough, it would be going backwards. So we said, what the hell is the good of going over in an Anson? Oh, there's a, a team of bow fighters at Mount Gambia. They will come over and pick you up if you uh, spot it, or if you spot a submarine. But what about guns? Oh, you wouldn't get a gun, but they've got guns. They would do the shooting. But we joined the Empire Ten Training Scheme at age 18 and up to the age of 32. At 32, they reckon you, you were too old to take risks and you had no guts to uh, get in and do the job. So the, the age was 18 to 32. The, uh, another photo there of the Mustang. The Mustang was not much good. It was a Yank fighter with uh, an American engine. But the RAF, when they got hold of the Mustang, they put Merlin motors in it and it changed completely. It became the main long range fighter. Uh, we were on a raid out over Germany and uh, we spotted a, an ME-262, the first of the uh, twin engine jets that the Germans had, and it was the first one we'd seen. And we were being escorted by seven squadrons of Spitfires, and they took off to chase this ME-262. And he just put his foot down and pshht, left them for dead. So we were very pleased that there were very few of those coming up when we were fight, flying. Another plane he had there was S for Sugar. It was flown by uh, Max Johnson from uh, oh, Northside and uh, we were on a raid to Ravini which was just off the Swiss border and uh, the master bomber Oh, we were flying due south and you could see the shining railway lines in the moonlight quite clearly. But the master bomber came in from the side and flew not north to south but east to west or west to east, whichever. And uh, 
he got just through a little way and uh, they opened up on him and shot him down. And immediately one of the Lancasters unloaded his bombs right across him. And then the deputy master took over and uh, he did the same thing as the previous master bomber. He flew across the stream. So we were flying north to south and we had to go around once to drop our bombs. Anyway, we came around and uh, the deputy said he could not uh, sight the target and he was told to pull his finger out and a lot of other uncomplimentary remarks and uh, he got shot down. But just before he did, he ordered sugar plum. That was the uh, cancel the raid and take your bombs back to Germany. So, of course, we had to uh, take, turn and return to uh, base. It was very cloudy and uh, we were attacked three times by fighters. So we dodged them by getting into the cloud. And I remember one cloud we came out of and uh, we were fighting an ME-109 right off our wingtip, almost wingtip to wingtip. But it was that quick and he was looking at us and then suddenly he's gone. So uh, he got away with it. But we got back and uh, then we heard Max Johnson's story. Max Johnson in S for Sugar was attacked three times as well. And he put the S for Sugar into a steep dive and ripped 138 rivets out of the starboard wing. The wing did not collapse, but he got back safely and they put it over to one side and it was finished. Anyway, the shortage of planes got that way that they decided they would re rivet the wing in S for Sugar and it is now in the museum at uh, Elmful, is it? Yeah. I think, uh, and it has been repaired. It, it carried on flying and ended up with 138 raids over Germany. Every time I saw Max Johnson, I would say to him, how are you flying, Max? No steep dives? <laughs> but we yeah, had... We better wrap it up. We've got to be out of here soon. Um, oh, another point then. The Australians, there were 4,050 4, were killed. And uh, that was how it was. There was one other. I was only talking about Bomber Command. There were other Australians killed. Yeah, this, this was Bomber Command. We there had a. Uh, just one. One bit. We had 200 flying members in the cruise on 460 Squadron. And uh, on the last raid, my skipper was badly wounded and I had to, with only 30 hours, I mean 30 minutes experience in the air, I had to take over the Lancaster and fly it back to England. And the next day, uh, Group Captain Huey Edwards had me parole and I lined up in front of him and he said, Jolly good show yesterday. I said, yeah, I was lucky. And uh, he said, have you ever thought of becoming an officer? And I said, not really. He said, uh, wouldn't you like to be an officer and come into the officer's mess? And I said, no, I wouldn't. And he said, why not? I said, there are a bloody lot of drunks there <laughs> and I don't drink. So he said, okay. Next day I had a commission. And you got a DFC too. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Um, I realise our time is gone. Yes. Got hit in the back, and the plane was headed for a village 
and he made it go into a field. And I've got his war diaries, all his letters home. It's very touching. I've, I've photocopied it and given it to RSLs, and, and I'm a teacher. I've given it to the schools. So that when, when they learn about World War II, it gives them a human aspect. So I've got this book for... I think the mayor saw the aircraft and saw it deliberately turn away from the village. Is that correct? Yes, and they've got a village. And his cousin was Billy Cause, who flew Nancy Wake into London. And Billy Cause came back with uh, went to grammar school too, Brisbane Grammar. He was born at Manfrabat, and so was Billy Cause. When Billy Cause came back, he became the member for Mansfield, Liberal member for Mansfield. I've got the diaries here. I'm not sure if I've already given one to the Royal Historical Society, but this one is here for anybody that wants to read it. Very touching when you read the stories of how how they're getting ready for missions and how they didn't really want to bomb those beautiful villages and everything at Christmas time. And it, it's really touching if you read the story. Thank you. I should just, hang on a second, Laura, I should just mention Dresden, because that's a very controversial part of the story. There are many conflicting reports about whether it should have been bombed or shouldn't have been bombed, but I've spoken to some people who actually were involved in that raid, and they believe quite strongly that it was a centre for German troop movements, and while it was destroyed and the figures were greatly exaggerated by the Nazis, Goebbels used it as a propaganda effort to try and say, look, you know, the, uh, the British are, are guilty of war crimes. And the figure, well, it's still horrendous, the figure that has been accepted generally, and there's been a lot of research done on it, it was probably 25 to 30,000 civilians did lose their life, lives in that bombing raid. Goebbels tried to put it out that there were 300,000 civilians killed. So the whole issue, Dresden was probably one of the key reasons why there wasn't the recognition of Bomber Command after the uh, Second World War. And there were also two th other things that happened, or one other thing mainly, uh, some of the crew who fought in the Australian crew were criticised because they were not directly defending Australia. They weren't back here fighting the Japanese. And there were some fairly sad occasions where they were sent white feathers because they were seen as having a soft option back over in Europe when you know, the real war was defending Australia back in Japan. But I think our time has almost gone, but I will give Laurie the last say, unless anyone else uh, you really wants to say, OK, and then we'll get... You said the Americans did the daylight raids. Yes. Well, why did they do that? It was an agreement reached with Bomber Command to try and put the pressure on the German cities. They were being bombed day and night, and the factories wouldn't be able to operate because they'd be sheltering. And actually, Daryl's probably got a better answer. But it cost the Americans so many crews they lost so many planes and aircraft that they couldn't keep going. They had to stop. They couldn't do daylight bombing for the continuing period. Americans' total bombing system was set up for daylight. They couldn't really operate at night. So that's it. That's it. British had to bomb at night because, as Laurie would know, they couldn't find a city in Germany in the early part of the war. Yeah, then. All right. Um, is there anyone desperate up to say something? I'll give you the last word. Laurie, you're the person we honour here today, along with many others who didn't come back. But thank you for what you've done and your service. A correction here. Uh, we did about 50-50 daylight and night raids. The RAF, following on D-Day, was called on for a lot of daylight raids. And we were successfully bombing them, this thumb blew up an ammunition train that was headed to the uh, invasion force and it was not recognised by Bomber Command because they did not give, uh, they did not acknowledge the work that Australians and other uh, not English people who were flying what they did. And uh, the raid on Maley, it was around about two degrees east, and uh, those who flew on it got one third of a raid. And the next raids that were coming up, the uh, Bomber Command said, okay, if it doesn't go past two degrees east, you only get a third of a raid. So the aircrew uh, revolted. <laughs>
They said, not good enough. So they made it half a raid. Now, on half a raid, for anywhere past uh, the coast and up to two degrees east, but if you went further, of course it was a full raid. Now I did 35 raids because I did several half raids. And uh, following on D-Day, the Bomber Command lost more people killed than what the British Army did in the first three months. So it was pretty severe. We better stop because people need to go. And uh, thank you, I think, Sophie, did you want to come and just wrap things up? Or maybe you better invite Laurie to give the next talk. And, uh, <laughs> I would hope it's been useful. There are a lot of things that I didn't cover today and I hope you understand. But also, this is the first time I've given this presentation. I will give one plug. Laurie has written four books and he's keen to sell them, I know. So, there we go. <laughs> Can you cake it short and sweet? A Queenslander got set on fire and he gave the order to bail out. Everyone bailed out and he turned around to get hold of his parachute and hook it on as the plane blew up and he was blown out into the air at 20,000 feet, no parachute. As he came down, he felt something and he grabbed quickly both arms and it was a fellow's legs. And they came down together and survived. But the fellow whose leg was grabbed, he had a damaged leg and he cursed this fellow because it hurt his leg. <laughs> Thank you very much.